Welcome back to another Profang video. And today, the Portuguese Empire. Many know of the Dutch Empire colonizing Indonesia, the British Empire dominating the subcontinent of India, but another European Empire controlled both these areas, to a limited extent at least, before those, those two large empires. It was the Portuguese Empire. I find this topic to be one of my favorites in history. That's why I made another video about the Portuguese. It wasn't as detailed or inclusive as I would have liked it in my first video, so I decided to talk about the whole empire in one video. Let's start now. Portugal, in the 12th century, was a vassal controlled by the Duke of Porto under the Kingdom of Leon, which would go on to become Spain. The Duke of Porto, Alfonso, in the 12th century, decided that being a king was better than being a duke, so he rebelled against the King of Leon and won independence He became and became King Alfonso I of Porto. Alfonso drove south, taking all of what is now mainland Portugal. The capital was moved to the old Muslim city of Lisbon. But how did he conquer the city? He had help from the most unexpected source, the Templars. But who were the Templars? They were a crusade happy order of knights that were kicked out of France with the aid of some fire and stakes. The order of the Templars helped Alfonso take the city of Lisbon and would serve in the courts of the kings of Portugal for the next century. All right, I wanna talk about the rest of early Portuguese history, but we really must be moving on. Portugal realized they were dirt poor by European standards, which was very poor at the time, but they had a lot of coastline and natural harbors, like the one in Lisbon. So from 1394 to 1460, King Henry the Navigator, who supposedly started a naval academy in the south of Portugal, teaching an entire generation of sailors and map makers. These resources, Portugal began discovering islands off the coast in West Africa, helping with the money situation. The first and longest lasting of the Portuguese territories were Madeira and the Azores Islands, which are still in the hands of the Portuguese today. Sugar at this time was very lucrative. Back then, sugar in Europe was so rare that the Princess of Castile, daughter of Isabella, who sent Columbus on his world-changing expedition, got a sugar in a cup for her birthday, which was a gift to be cherished. But Portugal did not have a large amount of people to go farm sugar, so they got an idea that had been thousands of years in the making. Slavery. The Arab world had been trading in enslaved Africans for centuries, so the Portuguese bought from Morocco and North Africa, and that's how the Atlantic slave trade got started. You can watch this crash course video in the link in the description about how this awful practice was thousands of years in the making. Portuguese sailors continued to trade up and down the coast until they reached Ghana, where they set up a huge castle or a, called a, fa a Faitoria. It was a military garrison, trade hub, and trade outpost. The Faitoria in Ghana is still standing today. These Faitorias made it much easier to go up and down the coast, because every few miles there was a rest station. In, the, in later years, these Faitorias would be peppered all over the Indian Ocean. The Gold Coast, as it was known because it provided a lot of gold to the Portuguese, made the Portuguese very rich. They continued to go down the coast of Africa until they settled a city called Luanda in Angola. And then, on May 20th, 1498, the one and only Vasco da Gama reached India by going around Africa, which had never been done before. Vasco traded his meager European goods for some pepper, which was highly valuable back in Europe. The king of Portugal, having heard of Gama's success, wanted to establish more trade with India. It is unclear why Gama did not lead the second expedition to India, but the king Pedro Alvarez Cabral to lead the mission, perhaps because he was loyal to the crown. However, nothing went as the king had intended. Pedro de Alvarado tried to set up a trade port post in Calicut, but he got into a fight with local Muslim traders. His men were attacked and the trade post was destroyed. And for, and for the next half century, the Portuguese in Calicut would fight. And the Portuguese only brought Calicut to its knees when Alfonso de Albuquerque arrived in the 1520s. But we will get to him in a minute. So after fighting Calicut, Cabral moved his expeditions to Cochin, where the ruler would be a faithful ally to the Portuguese. After setting up a factory and loaded it with pepper, Cabral and his crew headed back to Portugal. The king, being displeased for obvious reason, discharged Cabral and chose Vasco da Gama to lead the next expedition, which was to punish Calicut. Vasco bombarded Calicut for two days straight, which was, an, was unprecedented in India. Gama also exacted tribute from the, from the Sultan of Kilwa, one of the numerous trade posts in East Africa. He also did some horrible things to some freighters, and became very rich in the process. The next person to lead an expedition to India was Alfonso de Albuquerque. His mission was to set up an, a base on the island of, of Socotra. He also set up forts in Cochin, which would defend Cochin from, from attacks from Calicut. But as this was going on, the conquerors Constantinople, the Ottomans, who were pretty upset that Portugal had bypassed them in getting to India, started to form a coalition with Venice. Venice had also been losing prestige in Europe, because Portugal could now get much larger quantities of spices to Europe than they could. The Indian princes were also mad at Portugal for sacking and pillaging the Arabian Sea trade routes. 
These powers came together to form a coalition against the Portuguese to try and expel them from India. This would cause a coalition against, from, of Italian states in France and Europe against Venice and would lose all of their hard-won territory outside of Venice. But we don't need to talk about that. In response to this new league, the Portuguese realized that they needed to build a stronger empire to protect their interests in India. The Portuguese king Manuel then appointed Francisco de Almeida to be the viceroy or governor of India. Almeida amassed a massive fleet of 20 ships and 3,000 men. He, and when he got to India, he built more Portuguese forts along the Malabar coast. Meanwhile, with Venetian and Ottoman help, Egypt, another anti-Portuguese power, built a fleet of warships at the, at the Red Sea's port of Suez, near the modern Suez Canal. Let's hope a ship doesn't get stuck there. After setting up some more outposts in Sri Lanka, Francisco San Lorenzo fought the Egyptian vanguard force at the city of Chau. Lorenzo fleet fought hard, but were defeated in a three-day battle. Lorenzo died in the fighting. His fighting. His father, outraged, assembled his army for a big battle with, against the Egyptian fleet. And historians like me prepared their popcorn for all time, because oh boy, the final showdown, for now at least. But first he had to go into open rebellion against the king and lock up Alfonso de Albuquerque, who had been sent as governor instead of Francisco. But the Battle of Diu was here, and the, Port the Portuguese flagship kept hundreds of Indian warboats at bay, while the rest of the fleet slaughtered the Egyptians. After that, Francisco did hand over power to Alfonso and died fighting hunter-gatherer peoples in South Africa. And European fleets would dominate the waters of Asia for 500 years. But it was Alfonso's time to shine, and oh boy did he! First, he knew that Portuguese India would need a capital, so he conquered the city of Goa, which would stay in Portuguese hands until the 60s. Then, with only 1,000 soldiers, he conquered the very important city of Malacca. The tax revenue from this port in the Straits of Malacca would be more money than any of these men had seen in their lives. He then sent an expedition that, which would set up Portuguese rule in Macau, China. The Portuguese would only cede back the city as an autonomous region to China in 1999. He also sent expeditions to set up trade outposts in Terante, Indonesia, and East Timor. But after that, he returned to Goa. He then failed to take the port of Jahad near Mecca. The fact that he felt that he could take the city showed how entrenched the Portuguese had cut into the Arab world. He did pick the port of Muscat and Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. Alfonso de Albuquerque would die in Goa, and his successor would defend the port of Diu from Ottoman and Indian attacks, strengthening the empire. But the fall of the Portuguese empire would come from the Dutch and British, the Dutch would take Malacca in the East Indies or Indonesia, and the British would take India, except for Goa and Diu, which would still be in Portuguese hands. The Portuguese also kept East Timor until the 70s, which is why half of that island near Australia is its own country. The Portuguese monarchy was able to keep Goa and Diu because the Portuguese princess married the British king. Portugal would also keep Brazil until it declared and fought its independence and won in the 1800s. After that, Portugal would expand her African colonies into what is now Angola and Mozambique, and they would be stopped from linking the two by the British, who took, the land for, who took that land for themselves. Now, I'm not saying that all of this conquest was just in any way. Some became rich, but many others became poor and enslaved. I'm just giving the facts about the history of Portugal's world conquest, because it is not very often talked about in this event in world history. But anyway, let's finish this off with the World War I. Portugal was slow to join the Allies in the war and fought in Africa and the Western Front, gaining more territory in Africa. After that, Portugal supplied both sides of World War II with materials needed to make bullets. Portugal also gave homes on Madeira and the Azores to Jewish people fleeing the Reich and refugees from Gibraltar when there was a rumored German attack on the British territory. After that, the dictator, who was ruling Portugal at the time, tried to keep the colonies in line. But in the 60s and 70s, they would all fall, except for Macau, which they would cede back to China as an autonomous region in 1999. So there you have it, a history of the Portuguese Empire... If there was stuff that you would like to dive into further, there are some more YouTube videos in the description. And as always, have a nice day.